What to review? What to review? Ah, now that I have fraps, I can rip Wake of Death in English. Hello World Wide Web, I'm Dagger Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. After working with Ringo Lamb in the 2003 movie In Hell, Van Damme was set to work with him the following year on another action movie, Wake of Death. However, things didn't exactly go according to plan. Ringo Lamb only worked on the project for a couple weeks before he decided, for whatever reason, he'd rather not be involved in this movie. After him, Cesc Silvera was put on the director's seat, but after only two weeks of filming, he was out and out fired, with this movie's direction eventually falling into the hands of Philippe Martinez, who had only ever directed one film before, Citizen Verdict, the previous year. <sighs> Great. Well, maybe this will surprise us like In Hell did. So, let's take a look at Wake of Death and see just how scrambled direction tastes. We open up to Van Damme sat in darkness as he thinks about the car chase one hour into the movie. We can see here that the action direction of this scene isn't too bad, and of course he has to save a little girl as a gas truck careens in their direction, and we cut. Oh come on, who really thinks that Van Damme's gonna end up with a face full of holy fuck god boom? Uh, sorry, I'm not exactly on the edge of my seat wondering how that scene is going to end. After this, we see him think a bit more before remembering that movies generally start with the opening credits as we're introduced very intimately to Sun Quan, played by Simon Yan. Well, shit, way to kill the mood. Fuck, why don't you just... Uh... Um... Never mind! And even better! Kim saw the act in question! Which makes me wonder just how much she was spying on her mother, and runs off into the credits to escape, evidently finding her way onto a boat. How did she get passage? What did it cost? Why was this her best option? All of these questions will be completely ignored, so let's just continue. The next scene reintroduces us to Jean-Claude Van Damme playing Ben Archer, whom the online synopsis says is an ex-cop, and the DVD case says is an ex-mob enforcer, but as far as I can tell from this scene, he's just an ex-bouncer. I'm tired. The clubs. The smoke. The drinking. Well, the club owners are relatives, I think. And Italian, so of course they must be in the mob if they are Italian in an action movie. But said wife apparently is an officer with the INS, whom are the first on the scene to raid the boat of refugees and tell everyone on it they're going to have to get their asses put right on another boat headed back to China. She picks the important one out of the bunch and has a word with her boss. I know this is against the rules, but I'd like to take her home with me. Wait, what? What fucking reason would an INS officer have to do this? She's been through hell. I don't think we can dump her in some detention center. And the rest of them look like they're doing so fabulous. Please. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't want to lose my job over this. Then he shouldn't break the fucking law! Cynthia then decides to strike up a conversation, but it goes about as well as expected. You're coming home with me. Is that okay with you? Good. Oh, like if she said no, you'd give a fuck. Cynthia brings Kim home with her, and Kim shows Ben her performance of One Girl, One Cup. doesn't look like chocolate. Cynthia puts Kim to bed and we get another agonizing scene. What's wrong, Kim? I need the light. Nihoitsai, Mangle, Jiandua. Kim, you know how to speak Chinese. My foster parents are Chinese. 
Okay. I can accept Kim would be frightened and clam up and everything, but Cynthia? If you knew fluent Chinese, why didn't you try speaking Chinese before? Now go and sleep. And would you please show some emotion outside of unnaturally giddy? With that out of the way, there's no better time, it seems, for Ben and Cynthia to give us another gratuitous sex scene, after which they unwind in a bath with some lovely pillow talk. Ben, I'm a social worker for the INS. I see terrible things every day. Oh, such nightmarish, horrible things. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? I'm not an idiot. <coughs> They'll never leave me. I won't. Oh, thank God! She's as good as dead. But, uh-oh, Sun Quan has arrived in Los Angeles! In his jet that is far too small to be able to make a trans-Pacific flight. And has one thing on his mind. His daughter. Well, if they don't know where she is, then they obviously can't know if she's... <sighs> Wait, how the hell did they know to check Los Angeles? At that morning's hearing, Cynthia is told the obvious that, Oh yeah, taking an illegal immigrant into your home is, surprise, surprise, illegal! And her story about how her mother was murdered is a matter for Hong Kong police, not U.S. Hoggins, I want you to contact the proper authorities over there. I'm going to order immediate deportation. Your Honor, give me a week to prove my case. Prove shit! The point is it doesn't matter! It's several thousand miles out of their jurisdiction! I need one week. I'm just asking for one week. All right, all right. Here. It's been one week since you looked at me. Of course, despite all logic, she somehow gets her week, but uh-oh, it turns out Mac Hoggins was working with Sun Quan all along! And the boat of immigrants with his daughter also just so happened to have a couple of Sun Quan's mules who swallowed bags of heroin to smuggle into the States. Well, isn't that the mother of all coincidences? And Mac Hoggins was there, apparently already on the lookout for Kim. Why didn't he just nab her right then and there? Because the writing doesn't make any sense! She's with a social worker. I thought she'd be better off there than in a detention center. Much better. So much easier to lose. But now that Mr. Kwan knows what family she's with, he immediately knows to hit the Chinese restaurant where Cynthia's foster parents work. How? Good fucking question! The direction here isn't bad, and does a good job giving it a very dark tone, but the fact that Sun Quan somehow knew to arrive in Los Angeles before even knowing his daughter was here, and now knew to hit the restaurant first instead of starting with, oh, I don't know, the home where she was staying, maybe? Contrived doesn't begin to describe the direction the plot has gone. Yes. Yes. Do it! Don't fuck around with it, kill her! Do it! Do it! Come on! Do it now! Thank you! Uh, um, I'm actually surprised that Lisa King showed some emotion outside of Giddy for once in the movie. Hmm. Oh well. Ben is conveniently driving up at this point, and sees Asian people, so naturally assumes there's an action scene going on. <laughs> Taking everyone out with ridiculous ease, he enters the restaurant to find the terrifying truth. You know what? Never mind. Her corpse still looks unnaturally happy. Now Sun Quan decides it's a better idea to check Ben Archer's house, but unfortunately for the psychic criminal mastermind, she's not here, so instead... <laughs> you know, awesome as that was, I still have to point out the fact that it would have been a hell of a lot easier to just shoot him through the window. They dance back and forth for a few seconds before the assassin randomly decides to just drive away, and the plot is given an assist when Ben receives a call. 
Somehow, it took the kids all day to run to Max's house on the Italian mob side of the family. Which makes me wonder just how the hell Nicholas even knew about them. What kind of an upbringing was Ben giving him? Oh, here's your Uncle Raymond. He makes custom fitted cement shoes for people who talk too much. After making sure his son is okay, Ben rather harshly interrogates Kim. <laughs> Who's after you? Sun Quan. Who's Sun Quan? Did he kill my wife? Why did my wife take you here in my house? Because it's hard to have a revenge plot for a movie if she's still alive, so... Um... Shit happens. As things wind down, we're introduced to Tony Shiena, who plays the role of Tony. What? Uh, well, fuck that name. Let's just call him Player Two. They discuss Sun Quan in the triads while eating pasta, thus re-establishing their Italianness and getting the revenge plot underway. Hey, sweetie. He's upstairs, room 107. Thanks. That was your code word? Hey, sweetie? Like no one else was going to say that to her tonight? Likewise, Ben and Player 2 don ski masks and raid the club, with Ben heading upstairs blowing away several of Quan's men in the process. Before long, he's face to face with Wang. He's in a brothel face to face with Wang. Uh, yeah. So much for the ski masks. That's for my wife. Fuck you. Really? Didn't think maybe he might have had some useful information in those brains that you just splattered all over the wall? Hoggins arrives at the scene because, of course, INS is completely interchangeable with homicide. Two guys, ski masks, no fingerprints. Professional job. Yeah, except for that one girl who told every other guy she met room 107. Hoggins immediately hoofs it over to Quan to report the situation. We are supposed to be running a quiet little smuggling operation here, and you have turned it into a fucking movie. No, First Look Studios turned it into a movie. One man walks into your whorehouse and takes out three of your guys. Uh, two men? I speak to LAPD. They tell me they think his name is Ben Archer. But uh, when the fuck did this happen? We just saw them tell you they had no idea who the two guys in ski masks were and that they left no fingerprints. Where the hell are the characters getting this information? Back with Van Damme at the friendly Mafia bed and breakfast, they are trying to figure out where to go from here when the only LAPD officer in this movie happens to show up. What happened at your house last night? I broke a window by accident. And shooting seven rounds in the street, that was... Accident. Of course, firing off a gun like that is still illegal, but don't worry about any character that's moving acting reasonably logically, Ben's fine. He talks a bit about the shooting at the whorehouse and lets a bit of information slip. Hoggins from INS. He even showed up. Hoggins. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure that out. It's the movie's plot. Don't try to figure it out, it's not worth the headache. Based on this, they head out to find Haggins and have a word with him. And by have a word, of course I mean stuff him in their trunk, tie him to a chair, and give him the good old-fashioned mob interrogation. Good thing they already knew he was working for San Juan. Wait, no they didn't. What the fuck is this? I mean, what the fuck do you want? Well, I think it's obvious by now that they're not asking for directions. Okay. I don't know who killed your wife. I don't know who the fuck San Juan is. Under. He refuses to talk, so they get out the drill and... <laughs> Fortunately, Ben is interrupted by the one-man police force and has to head out to the morgue immediately. Because Ben is somehow important to the investigation of the immigrants stuffed with heroin? Oh well. At least the torture scene is... There. <laughs> Anyway, after enough of this, he tells them that Kim is Sun Quan's daughter and where Sun Quan is. Drill his fucking head off! No! Jesus fucking Christ! Are they done yet or are they gonna spend the next ten minutes drilling his corpse? 
By the time Ben makes it to the morgue, the tribes have already killed the entire LAPD and recovered the heroin, so a motorcycle chase ensues that actually is pretty entertaining and creative. As they go from the street and into a mall, ending in a bloody fight that, of course, nobody makes any attempt to stop. This gives way to our slow, poetic recap montage. So, of course, it's time for the bad guys to kidnap the kids. How did they find out where they were? The tribes followed them home when they kidnapped Hawkins. Yeah, there actually was a reason for once. This immediately transitions into a car chase as Ben pulls up, and surprise, surprise, it's the one from the beginning of the movie! So let me think. They were chasing, shooting, did the turn of spinning, and... Oh yeah, the truck! What's gonna happen next? DRIVES AWAY! Yep. Oh, and shit blows up. Thus, it's just Ben, Kim, and Player Two, as his son apparently was in the other car and is being held hostage. Why did they kidnap him in the first place when it was only Kim they wanted? SHITTY WRITERS! Fine, I said it! SHITTY WRITERS! They discuss heading down to get Nick back, but Ben has something to tell Kim. Sun Quan is your dad. No. He can't be my dad. No. That's not true. That's impossible! That's gonna make her feel so much better about the situation when you leave tonight to kill him. Why the fuck did you tell her that?! They spend a few minutes showing everyone setting up the game board for the climax, and since he's the white piece, Van Damme gets to move first. Listen, if I'm not back in... in 20 minutes, call the police. Okay? In fact, uh, might as well do it now. I don't know what the fuck I was thinking bringing a little girl to a shootout. With this, Ben gets things started in a pretty impressive move, leaping out of his car and using it as an exploding starting gun as he and Player Two begin the assault on the triads. This action sequence is alright, it's not badly done, but there really isn't much to differentiate it from any other action movie. Player Two runs into trouble though as a triad cuts him, stabs him, and stabs him some more for several minutes before... <laughs> Sorry to call bullshit again, but how the fuck did that kill him so fast when Player Two was still kicking after being stabbed at least five times? This finally brings us to the showdown with Sun Quan keeping the convenient child close by, but of course Kim runs in to see Daddy, giving Ben the chance to kill her father right before her eyes! What, now she wants to be with Daddy all of a sudden? If that was the case, couldn't they have just done a simple exchange and, you know, that would have just worked out okay for both sides? Well, that not enough dead people in that situation, is that it? Shot as well, Ben hugs his son and the camera pulls back, ending the movie in a manner desperately trying to be emotional. Did he live? Like most of the important plot points, that's not answered. So, uh, I'll just say, um... No! He knowingly went into a shootout without bringing a bulletproof vest, so he gets what he bargained for. Well, that was Wake of Death, and, uh... It's one of the most impressive, shitty movies I've ever seen. It's obvious, the plot is atrocious. The premise is alright, but there are way too many things that are left unexplained or are simply ridiculous to begin with. Van Damme doesn't do a bad job as Ben Archer, but the character is still very shallow, and Cynthia was one of the most awkwardly portrayed shoddy plot devices I've seen in cinema. Simon Yam's performance as Sung Kwan matches the style of the cinematography very well, but his motives are unknown at best, contrived at worst. The side characters are pretty well acted, but every minor role is only for a henchman, giving the world a very sparse population, though I guess that's more of a nitpick. 
The thing that kills me is, as badly written and haphazardly acted a film this is, the direction is actually pretty well done. Especially consider going through three directors in production, it's shot artistically and pretty smart with good angles and nice music, but the bare-bones plot is more fitting of a student film trying to be an action movie than a legitimate flick. It's like if you made a video game where a deep, involved protagonist with a long history and believable motivations had to go against generic evil to rescue a princess from the other castle. The mix of high-quality aspects with generic tropes ends Wake of Death at three murdered family members out of five. I didn't expect a movie that had such problems with its directors would impress me with its direction so much, and the writing is what would piss me off. Then again, Philip Martinez was actually one of the writers too, so I guess I can still be annoyed at him. Thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, always look both ways before crossing the food court. You know, I turned 52 last week, so I'm old.